prayer. Silent prayer is very important um, because at this time we make sure that we're not controlled by our sinful nature, that nature that we all have, that always desire to go contrary to God's will and God's plan. And at time, uh, we make decisions um, in what we think, say, and do, which is contrary to the plan and the will of God. But thank God for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who have already died for our sins and all we have to do to restore fellowship with God, to be able to be um, taught by him and his spirit is confess our sin. We acknowledge what we know to be a sin uh, and God clean us from all sin when we acknowledge um, our sin as believers. So what we like to do before any study of the word of God is to give everyone the opportunity to examine yourself. If there's any way you have offended God in what you thought, what you said, or even what you have done, take this time to confess that sin or those sin, and God will clean you of all sins so that you will be able to commune with him and be taught by his spirit as he seek to enlighten us, challenge us, strengthen us through his word. With that being said, let's spend a few moments of silent prayer for the confession of our sin. Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful uh, for another day of your grace. Uh, grace is all that you are free to do for us because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We come to you this evening and just ask of you to put us in a place where we can be able to be taught by you and used by you. Clean us from all sin. Thank you for these believers who set aside time in their day to study your word, to worship you through the study of your word. May you bless and honor them as they have blessed and honored you this evening. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, uh, thank you once again for joining our uh, Tuesday, I mean, Thursday, Thursday Bible study. Uh, this is our fast track. Uh, major doctrinal studies. Uh, we're looking at the major doctrines of the Bible. We're, we have been, in the last three weeks, we've been looking at the doctrine of man. And tonight, we're going to continue our subject uh, in Genesis chapter three on the fall of man, the fall of man. And so let us go to Genesis chapter three to begin our study of the doctrine of man with the fall of man. So let's go to Genesis chapter three, Genesis chapter three, Genesis chapter three. So this is class three of our doctrine of man study. For you guys who have uh, joined us for the first time, um, we are looking at the fall of man in Genesis chapter three. Now, today we'll be looking more at the uh, Adam's um, spiritual death and his depravity after he sinned against God. But we also will look at uh, the three sources of temptation, the three sources of temptation. Uh, Satan uh, don't have a new strategy. His strategy uh, to get men into sin is still the same. Uh, he, 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 he tempts man the same way he tempted uh, the first uh, man and woman in Genesis chapter 3. So let's begin in Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 1 and 2. Um, uh, just way of review, in our last class, we've been looking at the makeup of man. Man is a threefold being. He has a body, he has a soul, and he has a spirit. His body 
was created from the dust of the earth, as we see in Genesis 2, 7. His body was created good and to last forever by eating from the tree of life in the garden. But as we will see, because of sin, the body became corrupted and began to decay after Adam's sin, and the body must be ultimately redeemed and glorified. We saw that man's second being is he is a soul. The soul is the immaterial part of man, which uh, 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 and, and this soul lives in the body. Of the, uh, of the person. Now the soul have his own makeup and the makeup of the soul is the mind where thinking, perceiving, understanding, and the ability to discern come from the mind. The soul also have a will. It is what we use to make decision and decide the ability to exercise free will would determine our destiny. That's our will. Our soul also have a conscience. This is the conscience of knowing right from wrong, knowing right from wrong. And then our soul have emotions. This is our feelings. And as we're going to see in our study tonight is when Adam sinned, his entire being was affected by the sin nature or by sin. His body will start decaying, meaning dying. His soul is now corrupted by or come under the influence of his sin nature when he sinned. So he's depraved. And then the third aspect of man is his spirit. And the spirit makes man alive and able to function in communion with God. Well, his spirit is going to also die where he's not able to commune or fellowship with God as a result of sin. So man's entire being is going to be brought under the penalty of sin or under the, uh, the, uh, uh, the results of sin. And so he's totally depraved or corrupted. His body is decaying after sin. His soul is now controlled and brought into bondage by the sin nature and his spirit dies. And so that's what we'll be looking at. So let's start just as we'll review Genesis 3. We'll start at verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field where the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you should not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you surely shall not die. But God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirous to make one wise, she took from his fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. So what we see in these first six verses is that Satan, who at this time have fallen from heaven as a fallen angel, and he uses this serpent, the upright creature, as an instrument to tempt, the man, the, the woman, to tempt the woman to doubt God's word with the objective to lead her into unbelief and rejection of God's word. And so Satan's objective is to get men to doubt the truthfulness of God's word, to question whether the Bible is true or not, but the objective to lead them to unbelief and when a person is in unbelief, they reject the word of God altogether. And that is Satan's objective. And once men reject the word of God, then he decides for himself what is right and wrong, therefore becoming an independent creature or his own God. 
And that is Say's objective. That's what got him kicked out of heaven is he desired to be his own authority, to function independently of God and be his own God. And as a result, God saw the sin in his heart, judged him and cast him out of heaven. And so Satan's objective is to lead men into that same rebellion. And he start with the first woman and the man. Now remember, God gave a commandment to Adam before he made the woman from the man's rib. He told Adam, from every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you should not eat. The day you eat, you will die. Adam communicated God's message or God's truth to his wife, and the serpent went to the woman and wanted to raise doubt in her mind. Well, we know the story. The woman doubted God's the truthfulness of God's word. She added to God's word and she gave in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So in verse five and verse six, we see the sources of temptation, the sources of temptation. There's three sources of temptation. In other words, when Satan wants to get someone to sin, this is how he does it. How did he do it? Well, let's look at the three sources. In verse, uh, in verse uh, six, it say, when the woman saw, okay, that the tree was good for food, okay? Notice when she saw, that is the lust of the eyes. That is the lust of the eyes. The tree was pleasant to her eyes. It looked at good and beautiful and attractive. Whenever Satan sends a temptation, the temptation is going to come in the most attractive form possible. Because if Satan don't make it attractive, we may not bite the bait. So he has to make temptation attractive, beautiful. It looks good. But everything that looks good is not good for us. So this is the lust of the eyes. And it say, and that the tree was good for food. This is the lust of the flesh. The woman saw the tree was good for food. This is craving to satisfy one's physical pleasure or appetite. Say would take something like Something that is good, he will cause us to crave something that is bad. Or, or I give you an example. We could have a natural desire for intimacy with another person. Say it would take that natural intimate desire and channel it in a sinful way. If it's not according to God's word, it is sinful. And so get whatever, say, says, if it feels good, if it can satisfy your appetite, do it. And then, and then he'll make us think that God is holding those things back from us that is actually good for us. It make us feel good. That is the lust of the flesh. And then the last source of temptation in verse uh, six, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. This is the pride of life. Craving after possession to make one wise. Craving for status craving to magnify ourselves by having wisdom, desiring power through possession more above what have been given to us. That's the pride of life. 
Now, John, in the Gospel of John, told us the same thing that Moses recorded here in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. We see the command to love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. So Satan used his world system to appeal to our flesh, our eyes, and our pride, but ultimately to get us to be our own God through sinning, to be independent of God. Well, here in verse six, we see that the fall of man, Eve fell into Satan's temptation and the lust and desire of the flesh and the pride of life. She was deceived as 2 Corinthians 11, 3 told us, Eve was deceived as the scripture says, she was misled. But then she gave to her husband and he ate. Adam was not deceived. He knowingly disobeyed God. Eve was deceived. Adam was not deceived. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. He knew he could not be like God. So he chose to rebel. He was not deceived. But Eve was deceived by the devil. Now, I want to bring out a very important principle from Romans 5. Go to Romans 5, 12 through 14, because Many people blame the woman for sin being in the world. The woman is not the reason for sin being in the world because the woman was not the head of the human race. The woman was not the head of the human race. According to the Bible, the man was the head of the human race. Therefore, he is responsible for us being in the condition we're in. So go to Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 14. Romans 5, 12 through 14. Romans 5, 12 through 14. Verse 12, read of Romans 5. Therefore, just as through one man sin enter into the world and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all men sinned. So according to this verse, Adam was the head of the human race and was held most responsible for sin. So when he sinned, sin entered into the world by means of the sin nature that Adam possessed. So in Adam, as verse 19, go down to verse 19, go verse 19. For as through one man disobedient, the many were made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of the many would be made righteous. So through Adam disobedient, we were made sinners. So I am not a sinner because I sin. I am a sinner because I possess the sinful nature of my great-great-granddaddy, Adam. So way before I did anything good or bad, I was already a sinner because I possess in my body Adam's sinful, rebellious nature that desires to function contrary to God's will and plan. We all and cuter, your cute little baby was born desiring to function in contrary to God and his plan. All of us are born desiring to rebel because we possess the rebellious nature of our great great granddaddy, Adam. And so in Adam, we all die. So sin entered into the world because of man's capacity or Adam's capacity to choose between good and evil. And so you say, well, God created Adam perfect. If he created Adam perfect, how was he able to sin? 
Well, he was able to sin because God also gave him the ability to chew between good, choose to choose for God or against God, just like the angels who fell had a freedom to choose for against God. God did not create them as robots. They were had a free will. So sin in the world because of man's capacity to chew between good and evil. Sin worked his way in Satan through the same free will and found his way in Adam through the same freedom. So Adam used his free will to rebel against God. That's why we have sin in the world. People like to blame God for the chaos, the suffering, the pain, the death, the sicknesses that we see in the world, but we can't blame God. Everything he created was good. We have to blame, we have to blame the head, which is the man, Adam. Adam is the reason we're in the condition that we're in. The bottom line is, go back to Genesis 3. The bottom line is pride is a desire to be our own God. Adam and Eve were tempted with pride. Be your own God. Be an independent creature. Decide for yourself how you should live your life. Don't live your life based on the truth of God's word. Live your life however you want to live your life. Decide for yourself what is good and what is bad for you. And they did that. That's pride. And what did sin promise? I'm going to ask you all a, pro, a, a question here. What did sin promise? What did sin promise here? When, when Satan tempted the man and the woman, he was promising something through sin, where the woman was deceived, but he promised happiness, pleasure, gain, Something to satisfy. But what was the result? Sin never gives what it promises. Sin's prom sin promises us that if I can only have that, which is contrary to God's will and plan for my life, then I'm going to be happy. I'm going to find something pleasurable. I'm going to gain something for myself. I'm going to be satisfied. That's deception. That's deception. But sin don't give that. What does sin give? Well, what did God say? If you eat from the tree, you will die. Sin brings death. It brings guilt. It brings shame. It brings bondage. And it brings destruction. Look at verse uh, 7. Let's go to verse 7 now. The results of sin. Sin never gives us what it promises. Verse 7 says, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loins coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord and among the trees of the garden. Now they're ashamed. See, sin brings about shame. Yeah, it may bring temporary pleasure, but it may bring temporary satisfaction, but shame is coming. So now they're ashamed because they realize that they are naked. They realize they are naked and now they're ashamed. So sin don't bring satisfaction and happiness temporarily, but it brought about shame. But it also brought about spiritual death. When they sin, God said that you're going to die. But they remained alive after they disobeyed. So that means that death that God was talking about had to be a spiritual death, which is separation. Separation. Spiritual death means separation of the soul and the spirit from God. So what God was really saying when he told them that they would die he was saying dying 
you will die physically. The moment you disobey, you're going to die spiritually, but you're also is going to begin to, your body is going to begin to decay at that moment, prone to physical death. So God was talking about a spiritual death where the soul and the spirit will be separated from God. See, death in the Bible means separation or the inability to function in a particular realm. Spiritual death, the soul and spirit is not to not able to fellowship with God. Physical death, separation of the soul and spirit from the body. It began the moment of spiritual death. And then we have another death in the Bible called the second death. If a person died without Christ, they would experience eternal separation of their soul and spirit from God in the lake of fire. But the lake of fire was not was, was prepared for the devil and his angel, not for human. Human chew the side of Satan or the side of unbelief and rebellion instead of the side of faith and obedience. So the lake of fire was eternal death or separation of soul and spirit from God was not for humans. It was for fallen angels. But humans choose to go there by, they choose to go there to their rebellion and unbelief. So sin gives death, spiritual death. So sin, and, and 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 also when they sin, they receive. Uh, uh, they were created innocent, but now they're no longer innocent. Now they have a will. I mean, a sin nature that always seeks to operate contrary to the will of God. So man is totally depraved because he got a sin nature. And then verse nine, then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, "Where are you?" And he said, I heard the sound of thee in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. So they're ashamed. They're hiding themselves, but they're afraid as well. So they got guilt. Sin brings about guilt. Sin brings death. Sin brings guilt, and it brings shame, but it also brings bondage because when they sin, they receive a sin nature that control now their souls and influence their mind, their will, their emotions, their thinking. Everything come under the influence of the sin nature. So now they're a slave to their inner sin nature that desires to function contrary to the will of God. And we're all born in bondage to that sin nature until we get saved and get set free. So that's what sin brain, bondage and destruction. And look at verse 11. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Sin also brings shift in the blame. Shift in the blame. See, when we sin, we tend to, rather than take responsibility, for our sin, we sin to blame our failure on somebody or something else, you know, but God is not going to hear that. They're even blaming God for their condition. They're blaming, here Adam say, the woman that you gave me, you gave me this woman. So he's blaming God, but he also blaming the woman. And the man said, the woman, on verse 13, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The devil made me do it. She's shipping the blame. The devil, the devil only attempts. We choose to sin. Men sin because they choose to sin. They got a freedom to choose. The devil only going to tempt. The Bible say that Temptation is not a sin, but when we give in to the lust, then we have sin. Being tempted is not a sin, but when we choose to 
give in is a sin. Go to James chapter one. Hold your hand here and go to James chapter one. Go to James chapter one. Go to James chapter one and, and look at verse um, 12, uh, uh, 12 through 15. Blessed the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, for the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust have conceived, it give birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So sin is conceived when the person give in to the temptation or give in to the lust. And so the devil can tempt, but he can't make us sin. We choose to sin. We choose to sin. So there's, they can't use that as an excuse for sinning. All right, let's go back to Genesis 3. Genesis 3, verse 14. And the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, curse are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, the dough you shall eat all the days of your life. So here God curses the serpent for cooperating with Satan, allowing himself to be used as an instrument to get the woman and the man to rebel against God. And so God cursed this animal and that's how the serpent became what we know today as a snake that roamed on the ground. He is a symbol of sin, a symbol of death, a symbol of cursing on the animal kingdom. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. So here God said, I'm going to Make you your seed and the woman's seed is going to have hostility toward one another. In other words, believers and unbelievers, believers are part of the family of God, and unbelievers are part of the saints' family, and believers and unbelievers are in hostility to one another. But the seed of the woman will defeat sin and death and defeat the serpent. The seed of the woman is Jesus Christ. So God is promising here to save man from his lost condition by defeating sin and death through the seed of the woman who was Jesus Christ. Now, I want us to go now, well, go, go down to verse 16 now. To the woman, he said, I will multi greatly multiply your pain in childbirth and pain you shall bring for children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. So one of the, re one of the results of Sin is that the woman will bear children in pain. Uh, uh, the woman was created to procreate, but now she will procreate in pain and suffering. But also we see the reason there is a uh, the battle between the sexes, the battle between husband and wife in marriage, because here God said a woman desire will be to rule over her husband, but the husband will rule over her. And that creates suffering and problems in itself as a result of sin. Verse 17, we see man and the earth being cursed as a result of sin. 17 say then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you should not eat of it, cursed the ground because of you. So the earth is now cursed and told you shall eat all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. It shall grow for you and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. 
So the earth is cursed and Adam is cursed. He will have to work hard. And at the same time, the earth will not uh, 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 produce as it should, which make man's work even harder uh, as a result of sin. But also man will, uh, the moment man will disobey, his body now is decaying and going to return to the dust from which it came. But one of my favorite verses is in verse 20 and 21, because here we see the grace of God. Look at verse 20 and 21. Here we see the grace of God. What is grace? Grace is when God show kindness to us in spite of our sin, in spite of our failure, in spite of how much we messed up. Here we see God's providing for sinful man. This is called the grace of God. Verse 20 say, not a man called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Here it is. God provided a covering for sin, for shame, for guilt. He provided a covering for sin. That is grace. That is grace. God provided for those who don't even deserve such kindness. That is the grace of God. This is a picture of God doing something about man's sinful condition. He's taking action here. Man is not doing anything. The emphasis in verse 21 is on God's action. But what do man try to do? Man tries to work his way to heaven. He try to provide his own covering for sin through what he do, human good, human works. But that is not how God provided covering for man. He is the one that covers man's sin. This is a picture of an innocent animal having to die to provide a covering for man's sin. That is what God did when the scriptures say, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. And John said, when he saw Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus Christ is the covering. His work is the covering for all of our sins. That is the grace of God. See, it's not grace if I could provide a covering for my own sin. It's works. I earned it. I deserve it. But that is not how we're saved. We're saved by God's action, by Christ's work, not our action, not our work. Ephesians 2 verse 89, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not a result of your works, lest any man should boast. So here we see the work of God in providing a covering in his grace. Then you go down to the next verse, 22. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Who is the us? The us is the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now, lest he stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate it. Now, you know, I've never seen this before. Here it is. There is a garden, I mean, a tree in the, there's a tree in the garden called the Tree of Life at this time. Now, Adam and Eve used to take and eat from this tree before they fell. But now they're in a falling condition. And God run them out of the garden so that they would not eat from that tree. Why is that so important? I'm going to unmute you guys because I want you guys to uh, answer that question. Why do you think that is important? Well, here we see the grace of God again. All right, I'm going to ask y'all to unmute yourself. Anybody want to answer? Why do you think... God sent them out of the garden 
where they could not eat from this tree that they used to eat from? Why do you think he made them ran them out of the garden? Anybody want to comment? Hello? Hello? Yeah, I hear you. Hey, oh. hey, yeah. Um, in my understanding, I'm thinking the reason why God didn't want Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of life after falling into sin is because if they were to eat of the tree of uh, life, it means everything about them was going to become eternal, including the sin in them, thereby making them irredeemable. Amen. So the redemption process was going to be impossible. Amen. Amen. Good answer. Good answer. Becky, you wanted to um, say something? Well, if they kept eating, then they would keep living in these old sinful bodies. We got to get rid of these sinful bodies. So we got to exactly. die. And yeah, because the sinful nature stays with these old bodies and it would be terrible to live forever in this state. Exactly. Amen. Yeah. And so this is another picture of the grace of God. You know, uh, uh, this is because God knew what he was going to do and provide a redemption. He knew what he was going to do. And so, boy, it's just amazing his grace and love for these sinners and for us as well. Then we won't even be redeemable. <laughs> so thank the Lord that he ran him out of the garden. And uh, amen. Thank you all for that. That that. Um, uh, good, 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 good observation comment. Um, and so, um, so the destiny, um, you know, but at the same time, man had the privilege to eat from this tree before the fall, but sin caused him to forfeit the right, which was actually a blessing in disguise. Um, and see, our destiny as believer is to eat from the tree of life and live forever, but not in a fallen state because we have trusted in Jesus Christ as our personal savior. And God is going to take away our sin nature, give us new bodies, and then we're able. Now, now it's a blessing to eat from the tree of life in a redeemed state. Go to Revelation 22. Revelation 22. And see, this is the destiny of every believer is to one day eat from the tree of life. But it's only those who believe in Jesus and those who don't believe in Jesus will be eternally dead in a lost state that they die without Christ. Revelation 22. Revelation 22. Uh, let's look at verse uh, 1, 1 and 2. Let's look at verse 1 and 2. Can I get somebody to read that, if you will, please? Well, actually, let's read, let, no, let's read verse, verse 1 through uh, 7. Somebody, please. Revelation 22. 22. Go ahead. All right. 22, 1 through 7. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the, of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bear 12 manner of fruit and yielding her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true. 
And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy in this book. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So God's plan after Adam and Eve's fall is to redeem man through the person of Jesus Christ. So this is what human history is all about. Jesus Christ is by redeeming man uh, from his lost condition. Uh, that is the that's what the whole Bible is all about in a nutshell is to deliver us from the penalty of sin, the power and bondage of sin, and one day in the future from the present of sin forever and be restored back into our state uh, before Adam and Eve fell. And we will live forever and ever in the presence of God, no more sickness, no more dying, no more crime. And we have the privilege as believers in Jesus Christ, those who are redeemed, to share the gospel, this message with unsaved people so that they can be saved. Because if they die without believing, then they are no longer redeemable. But as long as they're alive, they can be redeemed. But once they die, there is no more opportunity to take of the tree of life. All right, so the only way back to God and life is through Jesus Christ. He is a solution to death. He is a solution to suffering. He is a solution to pain. He's a solution to everything. All right, let's go back to Genesis 3. Genesis 3, verse 23. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate it, the garden from which he had taken. So he drove them out at the east of Garden of Eden. He stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword were turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So this is, uh, we'll stop right here today and we come back. We will, um, I got one question before we close. One question before we close. So did Adam, did Adam have to sin? Did Adam have to sin and why? do men today choose to sin? Did Adam have to sin, one, and why do men choose to sin today, you think? Anybody want to answer that? Anybody want to answer that? Do it sound confusing? Well, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. I mean, Adam didn't have to sin, but I'll tell you okay. what, it's God's grace that it's even better now because in the garden, um, they were innocent, but they didn't have the righteousness of Christ like we do as sinners saved by grace. So we are in union with Christ, which is better than what they had. So I, I'm not sure how to answer your question, but um, well, you, you, you <laughs> yeah, you, you, you answered it. Uh, no, he didn't have to sin. He didn't have to sin. He chose to sin. Okay, and he want he sinned because he wanted to, and 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 the reason men choose to sin because all men. All men have the capacity to sin because of free will. We have the freedom to choose between good and evil. And freedom and free will is the reason man chooses to sin because God gave him that option. That makes sense? Oh, yeah, I definitely agree with that. It's interesting how he made angels different than us. And it sounds like they may have had a one-time 
decision to make, but they have so much more knowledge about, yeah. yeah, so, and then, you know how in the tribulation, after a person chooses to take the mark of the beast, they, there is no way for them to be redeemed, and I often thought about why, you know, they're still alive. Well, once they take that mark, I'm not sure if maybe with the AI and stuff coming on and brain chips, maybe their free will is taken away and Satan's controlling them so they can't even um, choose to believe on Christ at that point. Isn't that something? Yeah, I, I like the point that um, angels had so much more knowledge and so much more revelation than man and how their they will just want they had like a one-time choice uh and, and and where they're not even redeemable anymore but that makes so much sense and 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 even during the when jesus was on earth um at some point the uh the the the, the penalty on the religious leader was set where they could not even be redeemed because they had so they had witnessed all the miracles, the signs and the wonders, and they could not even be saved uh, at a certain time because they have had so much revelation, but yet they rejected it. And, uh, but yeah, yeah, that is, that, that is interesting. Yeah, I guess even Pharaoh, he hardened his heart. God hardened it too. Um, and that's, probably happening today because there's a lot of very very hard hearts yeah and god and and and, and pharaoh was already hardened so god just gave him up to his hardened heart and that was no way he was going to be redeemed once god gave him up to his hardened heart he had already hardened himself and, and people today the more they harden themselves against god that may be a time where it's like they're not even, I mean, the long, they're alive, they're redeemable, but I think that when they've been given so much revelation, then God may just give them over to their flesh and over to Satan, where it'd be, it'd be impossible for them to respond positive to God. Yeah, like the Pharisees and stuff, when they saw all those miracles, like you said, and then they attributed his miracles to Satan. It's like, mm -hmm. there's nothing else we can do for you because you've rejected everything. everything. So yeah, that's a very hard heart. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, believe it or not, this is the, uh, the conclusion uh, to our doctrine of man, man study. And, and what we're going to do now uh, next week Um we're going to be looking more in depth to the doctrine. We're going to start another study called the doctrine of sin. Now we'll look at sin in great detail on uh, next week. So this is a conclusion of our doctrine of man with the fall of man. And now we're going to look deeper into the doctrine of sin. And uh, I'm looking forward to this study because, uh, I'm just looking forward to it. Let me just say that. <laughs> so uh, if there is no questions or comment, we'll stop here. And I hope to see you guys next week as we begin this, this study on the doctrine of sin on next week. Any, any questions or comments? Any questions or comments? All right. Well, we'll okay. stop here. I... Uh, go ahead, Becky. Well, I had remember hearing when we were talking about sin, I'd remember hearing this old saying, and I'm not sure who to attribute it to, but sin looks so good, but it takes you further than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you wanted to stay, and it costs you more than you wanted to pay. So it's, if we don't know the truth, we'll fall for the lies. So that's why it's so wonderful for us to be in God's word and knowing what's going on. And then we definitely need to just choose each day. I want to please the Lord by his power. Amen. Amen. That's, that's, uh, hold on one second. I want you to repeat that again, because I heard it before many, many times, 
But say it again. Sin. Oh, sin, it looks so good, but it takes you further than you wanted to go. It keeps you longer than you wanted to stay, and it costs you more than you wanted to pay. Oh, my goodness. All right, you got to text that to me because I couldn't write it as fast as, as you said. It. <laughs> I'll <laughs> hey, text it to you. <laughs> all right, if you can uh, close us out in prayer, that would be awesome. Okay, Father, thank you that you are such a good God. And thank you that you created us and we are your most precious creation. And yes, we are weak and we are so stupid actually about things. Um, and our enemy is just laughs at how easy it is to lie to us and tempt us to get us away from you. Yet you and your grace made a way to redeem us and it cost you your one and only son. Thank you for doing that for us so that we could have be restored. We could be reconciled to you, not be your enemies, not, not go to hell that we deserve, but look forward to that day when we will step into glory and see you face to face. And Father, thank you um, for that. And please help us to continue to grow and be in your word so we will know the truth, so we won't fall for the lies that are all around us. Thank you again for your word. And I just pray that we would honor and glorify you in each day in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay, y'all have a good night and good weekend and see you next week, Lord willing. Okay, good night. Good night.